Congratulations, everyone and everything for everything you've learned so far today. Before we leave, we have one last presentation to share with you from Dr. James Hansen, who we were incredibly lucky to have with us today. Dr. James Hansen was formerly a director at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He is a professor at Columbia University's Earth Institute, where he directs the program on climate science, awareness, and solutions. He was trained in physics and astronomy and space science program of Dr. James Van Allen at the University of Iowa. And his early research on the clouds of Venus helped identify their composition as sulfuric acid. Since the late 1970s, he's focused his research on Earth's climate, especially human-made climate change. Dr. Hansen is best known for his testimony on climate change to congressional committees in the 1980s that helped raise broad awareness of the global warming issue. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1995 and was designated by Time Magazine in 2006 as one of the most 100 influential people on Earth. He has received numerous awards, including the Carl Gustav Rosby and um, Roger Revelle Research Medals, the Sophie Prize, and the Blue Planet Prize. Dr. Hansen is recognized for speaking truth to power, for identifying ineffectual policies as greenwash and for outlining actions that the public must take to protect the future of young people and other life on our planet. If you have any questions for Dr. Hansen, please put your questions in the Q&A feature and he will answer them after his presentation. Thank you. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks very much. So I'm uh, coming to you from my uh, office in my barn in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, climate change. You know, in one way, high school students today are lucky because you will live in a very interesting century. Humans are just beginning to change the climate and the change is going to get larger. But you have the opportunity to help shape the future. Um, the climate change story is, is actually pretty simple, uh, but managing the climate change will be complex because it involves our energy system, economics, the law, politics, human rights, among uh, several other things. Uh, but um, Let's see, before, before I get started, um, let me make a comment. Uh, I thought I should make a comment about the weather. Uh, it's been pretty cold here the last couple of weeks. Um, and also uh, in the Midwest where my relatives, most of my relatives uh, live. Um, so if I turn my computer around so you could see the uh, outside here, you see we've got about a foot of snow, which is very unusual. Uh, for us, last winter we had almost nothing. Uh, but the question is, how does this cold spell uh, stack up against global warming or what's the relation? Does global warming cause such cold weather? <laughs> so, so here's the story. In the winter, we always have, uh, let me uh, go down, yeah. Uh, we always have a polar vortex because th there's so little sunlight in the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic gets really cold. 20 or 30 degrees below zero is common. Uh, the tropics is of course warm and this strong temperature gradient drives the west to east jet stream in the upper troposphere at an altitude of about 10 kilometers. And if this jet stream is tight and stable, it keeps the polar air locked in the Arctic. But occasionally the jet stream becomes weak and wavy, and this allows warm air to move north at some longitudes, but at other longitudes, cold Arctic air bulges uh, south. And that's what happened over North America in the past few weeks. So did global warming uh, cause this? Um, 
Not exactly, but warming by greenhouse gases is larger at the poles. The Arctic has warmed about three degrees Celsius and the low latitudes about one degree Celsius. So that the temperature gradient is now a little weaker and that uh, increases the chance of, uh, it, it can tend to make the jet stream weaker and give you a better chance of having these cold air outbreaks and a warm air outbreak to, to the Arctic. So, so maybe there's a relation with global warming, but um, it's, it's just a probabilistic thing. Weather is always variable. And we got cold air outbreaks before humans uh, started messing with the, the atmosphere. Okay, so let's, um, okay. <laughs> um, why did I put this photo of our two uh, pet sheep here? Probably to remind myself that spring would be coming. There's grass underneath this snow. Cosmos um, is um, the troublemaker. He's always uh, complaining, the black sheep. Um, now, there's one Im important point I want to make. You know, you are inheriting a spectacular planet which is well worth uh, preserving. And uh, we, we should not be a pessimistic. Climate change, in my opinion, is not a gloom and doom story. It's an opportunity to preserve a remarkable planet. This, this picture happens to be a, a lake in Canada in the fall, but every day Microsoft puts a different picture on uh, my computer. And I saved a few of them. Of course, they do a good job of going out and find remarkable scenes. This one in New Hampshire, this one in the Alps, uh, this one in Alaska, this one in the Ukraine, this one in California. Um, and we have, <laughs> we have uh, interesting animals. <laughs> some that carry horns on their heads and uh, some that have long noses, which they can use in a number of ways. Uh, and uh, in the ocean, there are more than a million species associated with the coral reefs. They're really uh, quite, quite remarkable. We even have um, dinosaurs small dinosaurs with wings that can, that can fly. And my favorite uh, insect is uh, the monarch butterfly, which is just incredible. You know, it's, it's a flimsy little thing. I don't know what it weighs, <laughs> a couple of grams, I'm not sure, but it flies all the way to Mexico to hibernate in the winter. And it makes this annual cycle, uh, flying all the way to Canada and somehow finding its way back to the same uh, fir trees in the mountains in uh, central Mexico. Uh, it actually takes up four or five generations of the monarch uh, uh, going for, you know, from a caterpillar through this chrysalis uh, and the butterfly coming out, but this takes five generations to make the, the, the round trip from Mexico back to Mexico. Anyway, we have a remarkable planet. Uh, this is some of the butterflies in Mexico. Now let's um, talk about climate change. Um, Uh, humans um, began to alter the composition of the atmosphere in a substantial way with the Industrial Revolution when we realized that this black rocks, coal, contained a tremendous amount of energy and coal powered the Industrial Revolution for about a century before oil was discovered. And uh, it's even a more convenient fossil fuel because it's liquid. Uh, 
Um, one gallon of gasoline contains the work equivalent of 400 hours by a healthy adult. So it, it uh, provided a mechanism to raise the standards of living of uh, people in, in half of the world. Uh, so we've been burning more and more fossil fuels uh, with time, especially beginning after World War II. The um, fossil fuel use has increased steeply. Uh, most, this is all of our energies. Uh, the coal, oil, and gas are the fossil fuels, and they provide more than 80% of our energy. Nuclear power is the gray area, and then hydroelectric and the renewable energies. Uh, but most of it is from fossil fuels. And as you burn fossil fuel, the carbon is converted to carbon dioxide and enters the atmosphere. And what was 280 parts per million of CO2 before the Industrial Revolution has now increased to more than 410 uh, parts per million. And uh, that, that is causing the planet to get warmer for, uh, and Earth has warmed by more than one degree Celsius in the past uh, century for, uh, reason that's very easy to understand. The sunlight is not affected by changes in carbon dioxide because CO2 is transparent to a visible light, but it absorbs heat radiation, the long wave uh, radiation that mainly at eight to 13 microns in the thermal infrared, uh, so that before we changed the atmospheric composition, the earth would radiate back to space the same amount of energy that it absorbs from the sun because um, on the long run, you're going to establish uh, thermal equilibrium, but when we put these gases in the atmosphere, that, that uh, it's like putting a blanket on the planet because it absorbs the heat radiation. So temporarily, the planet is out of energy balance. There's more sunlight being absorbed than there is heat being emitted. Therefore, the planet gets warmer. Uh, and we see that happening. And we also, we can now measure how much the planet is out of balance because uh, the where does this excess energy go? Well, it goes in a number of places, but the atmosphere of the planet is very thin. It has a very small heat capacity. Uh, the land gets warmer, but it has a low conductivity. So this warming only goes down a few tens of meters. So that's also a small uh, heat capacity. But the ocean is four kilometers deep and it mixes. So it takes a long time for the ocean to come to a new equilibrium with the change in the atmospheric composition. So that's where most of the energy is going. It's warming up the ocean. We can now measure the ocean's temperature very well because uh, several nations cooperated in sending out more than 3,000 Argo floats, which um, dive to a depth of about two kilometers and then come slowly to the surface and radio their measurements to a satellite. So now we have a good way of keeping track of the ocean's uh, heat content. 
And what we find is that the ocean is gaining energy, uh, mostly in the upper ocean, but also some increase in the deeper ocean. And some energy is going into melting of ice as the uh, ice sheets are, are slowly shrinking, the glaciers are receding and the glaciers in Glacier National Park are going to disappear uh, because the planet is getting warmer. Uh, the, so the total uh, energy imbalance is, here I have it in units of watts per meter squared, averaged over the planet. And the sum is about uh, three quarters of a watt per meter squared. So, so that's a small amount of energy. I mean, you, you know how much heat is coming out of say about 100 watt light bulb. This is like having one tiny uh, Christmas tree bulb over each square meter of the earth's surface. Uh, that's how much heat the earth is gaining. And so that doesn't sound like much, but it's equivalent to uh, 500,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs per day, every day of the year. That much energy is going into the ocean and it's warming the ocean and it's having effects like melting uh, the ice shelves. So the climate situation is we do actually have a crisis, but it's not easy to recognize it because it's still, much of the effect is still in the pipeline because of this large thermal inertia of the ocean. And the other thing is there are amplifying feedbacks in the climate system. Um, as the world gets warmer, the ice melts back and exposes a darker surface that absorbs more sunlight and so causes additional warming. Also in places like uh, Canada and Siberia, the tundra melts and it releases uh, greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, and nitrous oxide. And that again is an amplifying feedback. So uh, there's more, because those feedbacks are slow, they're still just getting started. And so there's more change that's in the pipeline. Now one of, but the changes so far are not very large. Uh, one of the most important ones is sea level rise. Um, Sea level has, be, and this of course is mainly from melting of ice. Um, also to some extent is from thermal expansion of the ocean water as it gets warmer. But this is about uh, 200 millimeters over the last century, which is 20 centimeters, which is eight inches. Well, eight inches is not negligible, but it's, it's um, it's not a disastrous. Uh, we can, some places like Miami, you can begin to see now the streets are covered by ocean water at high tide <laughs> when they shouldn't be. Uh, but most places that's still uh, not a, a big problem. The, the danger is that, you know, if we look at the last time the planet was one, to two degrees warmer than pre-industrial. That was the Eemian uh, 120,000 years ago. And sea level was um, six to nine meters higher than, which is 20 to 30 feet. We really don't want that to happen because if you look at, this is a map showing all the large cities in the world. And you can see that most of them are on the coastline. We, and and uh, a sea level rise of six to nine meters would not completely cover these cities, but it would make them dysfunctional, the coastal cities. Uh, so we don't want that to happen. Uh, we need to 
limit the warming. And that's, that's one uh, practically irreversible effect if we would let it happen. The other thing that's irreversible is extermination of species. We're putting uh, stresses on different species in a number of different ways uh, as shown on this chart. Um, but in combination, we're also now shifting the climate zones as the planet gets warmer. And plants and animals uh, can live within certain climate zones. So if the zones shift, then they need to migrate to stay within uh, a livable uh, climate. Um, it's estimated that if we followed business as usual, greenhouse gas emissions for the next 100 years, that we could commit a significant fraction of the species to extinctions. So that tells us we really should not follow business as usual for another 100 years. And coral reefs are a good example. They harbor more than a million species and they are being threatened by warming of the ocean and by the acidification. As the ocean takes up more CO2, it becomes more acid and that can dissolve uh, carbonate uh, skeletons. So another reason that we have to limit the CO2 increase uh, because we're losing about a percent or so of the coral reefs uh, each year. So as I say, another reason that we don't want to go too far. Now, of course, uh, weather and climate are always variable. If this shows uh, this bell curve on the left is uh, an indication of the variability of a summer average temperature in the Northern hemisphere back in the middle of last century. Now, if we look at, and use that same uh, definition of what was average at that time, we see that the, the uh, bell curve is shifting. So we're getting more hot extremes. Uh, there's still some years that will be relatively cool even compared to the average of last century, but, but we do see in the data that the variability is, is shifting. And it's especially, the, the shift is especially large in the subtropics in the summer. Subtropics are like the Southwest United States and the Mediterranean region, the Middle East where the shift is uh, more than two standard deviations so that every summer is now hotter than the summers uh, in the middle of last century. And also in the tropics, the, in most seasons, the, uh, sh the shift is substantial, uh, a couple of standard deviations so that the tropics and the subtropics in the summer are becoming uncomfortably hot. It's hard to work outdoors uh, in those climates. Um, so the, um, see if I can get rid of this thing on my, uh, oh, okay. So um, the, The uh, increase of the regional climate extremes is now easily detected in the data. So dry regions tend to get drier because the increased heating of the surface causes more evaporation. Uh, and so you get a stronger um, droughts and greater fires 
in the dry regions, but wet regions tend to get wetter <laughs> because the greater evaporation, uh, what goes up must come down and you get greater uh, rainfall and more extreme floods and storms that are driven by latent heat because a warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. And that's the fuel for storms, for thunderstorms, uh, tornadoes and tropical storms. They get their, their fuel from uh, the water vapor and the warmer ocean. So um, it's beginning to have a detectable effect. So the, the hundred year flood now occurs more often than once a century. And uh, fires tend to burn hotter um, and are more extreme. Uh, we can see the, in the data uh, that the area burned in fires in the United States has increased in the last couple of decades. But there may be other factors that influence this, not only uh, the climate change, but just how we manage the forest. But clearly the fires are burning hotter and they're more damaging. Okay, so the, the injustice is first of all, from today's adults to young people, uh, we're potentially handing a situation that, which is a dangerous situation. There's also an injustice of the North to the South because the, the uh, climate change has been caused by the industrial North, but the biggest changes are at the low latitudes where uh, the people have contributed very little to the change of atmospheric gases. And of course, from humans to other species. So um, what can we do about this? Um, if we need to use a scientific method and that's to be objective basically is what it means uh, and not let your preferences or your ideology affect your assessment. So we know where the greenhouse gases are coming from. In a recent year on, on the left, China now produces more than twice as much fossil fuel CO2 as the United States. But climate change is caused by the cumulative emissions. It's accurately proportional to the cumulative amount. And the United States is more responsible than any other country for the cumulative emissions. But the growth is occurring in those countries which are now wanting to raise their standard of living, uh, especially China and India. Uh, while the emissions from the West have been fairly stable, but we're actually going to have to get emissions to decline in order to stabilize climate. And uh, you can see that the energy in these countries that are now becoming the big emitters is primarily from coal. That's where they make their electricity by burning coal and also for industrial processes, industrial heat. And, and that uh, coal has other effects. The, China inadvertently did a very interesting experiment. The government gave, beginning in 1950, for the next uh, several decades, they gave free coal to people north of the Huai River. And um, what the medical studies have shown is that it reduced the life expectancy of the people in North China by five and a half years. And the World Health Organization shows, finds that outdoor air pollution causes more, about three and a half million deaths per year. It's about 10,000 uh, per day. 
It's especially high in China and India. Um, so a crucial requirement for addressing both the human health and the climate problem is to find abundant, clean, carbon-free energy. Uh, but, you know, when, when countries are developing and trying to raise their living standard, they're willing to put up with pollution if they have to. We did for, for, tech, for quite a while before we began to have uh, laws that reduced uh, air pollution. Um, so we need to have energies that are competitive in cost with these fossil fuels. Um, so one way to do this, you need to make the fossil fuel price include its cost to society. What we're doing right now is allowing the fossil fuel industry to and fossil fuel users to dump the waste products in the atmosphere free of charge. And it has these effects on both climate and human health. Uh, so I argue that the simplest way to deal with this is to have a gradually rising carbon fee that you can collect from the small number of sources, the domestic mines and the ports of entry. So it covers all of the fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal. And if this money is distributed equally to all legal residents, that is, you know, the public objects to a carbon tax. Al Gore tried to put a five cent a gallon tax on gasoline. The public would not accept it. In France, they tried to have a fuel tax and you had the yellow vest uh, uh, reaction to that. And he had to remove that tax. But if, the, if it's not a tax, if this money is not taken by the government, but instead is given equally to legal residents, then it turns out that 70% of the people actually come out ahead. They get more in the dividend than they pay in increased prices. Wealthy people would lose money because wealthy people travel more, they have bigger house or more than one house. So their carbon footprint is larger and they would lose money, but they can afford it. Uh, and uh, if you had this rising carbon fee, it would stimulate the, uh, the uh, entrepreneurs to develop uh, carbon-free or low carbon energies and products that use less uh, fossil fuels. And so it actually stimulates the economy. Uh, you'd still want to have some regulations. For example, in the case of refrigerators, a builder will prefer to put in a cheap refrigerator rather than one that's more expensive, but is more efficient uh, because he, it, then his house is cheaper. But on the long run, you actually save money by having a more efficient refrigerator. So we should simply require such a thing. And likewise, in the case of electronic products, when they're not being used, they should not be drawing power. And if so, there is need for some regulations, but, um, and the government does need to facilitate uh, the development of technologies on long lead research and development. So there is now an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby which has as its objective getting Congress to pass a carbon fee and dividend. And there are now uh, about 200,000 members of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. So um, it's, I'm hopeful that we can uh, affect our democratic uh, system 
and get a, a carbon fee, even though the fossil fuel industry, which is very powerful in which gives money to Congress people uh, and so has been able to influence our government. But, um, but I think um, we're making progress. Um, and now I also, I don't know if I, let's see if I can make this, I wanna show a, a two minute uh, video if it'll work. Um, so, you know, there were 200,000 people there um, and they were singing, uh, give me the warm glow of a wood fire. Um, I showed you a chart that three and a half billion people a year, 10,000 people a day die of outdoor air pollution. Well, it's slightly more for indoor air pollution, about 3.7 million a year, um, 10,000 people a day die of indoor air pollution, uh, which is more than have died from uh, nuclear accidents in 50 years history of nuclear power. So I think, and, and uh, I, so I think we need to, objectively look at the potential of uh, nuclear power because a ping pong ball size of nuclear fuel, thorium or uranium contains enough energy to power uh, an American's 100 year lifetime all the energy that they use. So it's a very concentrated energy and potentially has the smallest uh, environmental footprint. Um, and with modern nuclear power, you, the, the uh, power plants would shut down in the case of an anomaly. So you could not have the kind of accidents that they had in Japan and the Soviet Union with their old technology. Uh, so anyway, my, my uh, grandson, uh, Connor, uh, was an Indiana Jones fan. And here he is looking at an urgent message. Uh, and Connor, when he was 10 years old, actually identified the two main uh, ideas where he said, if, uh, we can't figure out how to make a time machine that actually works, then there's going to be no way to go back and fix the climate. Uh, and the other thing is grownups are scared of nuclear power, but what about fossil fuels? We know that they're very dangerous. Anyway, um, it's, it's, it's interesting that nuclear waste has been so uh, important in affecting people's uh, ideas and making them oppose nuclear power 
But nuclear waste sits in containers where it's not harming anybody. While the waste from fossil fuels is dumped in the atmosphere or in your living room, and, uh, and it's killing people uh, at, a, at, at an enormous rate. And yet, and it's not that it's a pleasant death. It's like if you die from uh, smoking from lung cancer, it's not a pleasant way to go. So it's a little strange that we're so uh, irrational in considering and comparing the different energies. Um, this is a whale jumping uh, by the Diablo Canyon uh, nuclear power plant. And if you look at the history of adding energy, the fastest way to add energy has always been by adding nuclear power. So it's not, but you have to have a design that's approved and ready to go. And, and, and it has to be competitive in price with, uh, with the alternatives. So it's really unfortunate that three decades ago, uh, the United States sort of stopped doing research and development on nuclear power, even though there was very promising uh, technologies. Uh, so it's a little, a little behind, but I, but reason that I'm optimistic that we're finally getting on to a, a good course is in part um, the young people that I see. So there were, the, this was a message from 350 student body presidents in 350 universities, colleges uh, in the United States. And they, they have, uh, formed an organization in favor of carbon fee and dividend. And then another organization, uh, the Good Energy Collective, uh, organization of young engineer and, and other people uh, who are uh, working on modular, uh, modern nuclear power. Uh, in what they call a progressive policy agenda. Um, so, and you know, uh, sometimes you may get the impression from the big green environmental organizations that renewable energies are on the verge of taking over, of providing all the world's energy. Well, the task of replacing energies is going to be a big job. Uh, we're only just beginning. Um, as you can see for these uh, 71 different countries, uh, the uh, coal, oil, and gas provide most of the energy for most of these countries. So we've got a, we've got a big job ahead of us and uh, Cosmos is reminding me that this is the end of my presentation. So uh, I would be happy to uh, take questions uh, and discuss this. Alrighty, so if at this point in time you have any questions for Dr. Hansen, please go ahead and type them out into the Q&A feature. There's a box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Go ahead and type out your questions in there, and then we will be able to direct those to Dr. Hansen.
So it looks like we have a question. Uh, do you think climate change can be better prevented in the next 10 years? Uh, the question was, do I think climate change can be prevented in the next 10 years? And the answer is no. Uh, the, the, the world is now out of energy balance by uh, at least three quarters of a watt per meter squared. If we wanted to restore the planet's energy balance and stabilize climate, we could do that by removing some of the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. But we would have to go back to 350 if we did it via CO2, which is what we would have to do most of it with. We would have to go back to 350 parts per million. We're now at about 415. That's not easy to do. And you're not going to do it in 10 years. Uh, we filed a lawsuit against the government uh, 21 young people and I filed a lawsuit in which we uh, requested that the government restore planet energy balance by the end of the century. And that would be hard if you just do it by reducing greenhouse gases, you'd have to reduce emissions by uh, about 6% a year. So it's, you're not going to uh, reestablish equilibrium quickly, not in 10 years. And, and as I showed on one of my last charts, you know, the, the fossil fuel use, the growth is now in countries that are developing. India, still China is still increasing. And Indonesia, it, it, various countries, they're not going to stop trying to raise their standards of living. So unless, unless we have alternatives, uh, it's going to be a slow process. But finally, there's, there's at least an agreement that we have a problem and that we should be working on this. The, the simple way to change the, the direction is with this rising carbon fee. This Citizens Climate Lobby Group has shown that if you had a $10 a ton fee going up $10 a ton each year, after 10 years, you would reduce the emissions 30%. That's faster than anybody has accomplished with the methods that they're using because you want to try to affect all the uses of fossil fuels in society. So we, we can do it and, we, and it actually makes sense. We should make the price of fossil fuels honest by including their cost to society. Um, but it's going, to take, it's going to take at least several decades. Um, and it's going to, it's going to require fundamental changes in our energy systems, but it actually stimulates the economy because you need to develop the replacements. Um, the economic studies that Citizens Climate Lobby has commission show that it um, causes the GNP to increase and create several million new jobs if you uh, have this rising carbon fee. So it's, uh, anyway, the answer is no, you can't do it in 10 years. The next question is, can you describe what it was like when you first brought climate change to the attention of Congress? Well, um, <laughs> you know, it was, um, it was pretty straightforward in my opinion. We had been working on the climate model and on observations, uh, 
and for several years, and um, it had become clear from the data that the planet really was getting warmer and that it was consistent with what we expected given uh, the change in greenhouse gases. So I thought it was pretty straightforward. <laughs> I found <laughs> that um, a lot of other scientists uh, were not willing to, to say this yet. And there was an article published in Science Magazine, which was titled Hansen versus the World, <laughs> because there was a conference in which all the, their conclusion was, no, you can't, you can't make this conclusion. Um, within several years later, though, essentially everybody agreed. So uh, anyway, it was interesting. Uh, the next question is, if the environmental Kuznets curve hypothesis is true, what are some ways that less developed countries stay clean while improving their economy? Yeah, so uh, they need to have options. Uh, I, I think, you know, the big increases in emissions have been coming from China and India. I helped to organize a workshop in China uh, because, and I, I think we should work with them. They, they actually want to replace their coal burning uh, with clean energy, with both the combination of renewable energies and nuclear power. Um, but they don't want to use the old technology. We have, uh, we know how to build modern nuclear power plants that uh, would shut down in the case of any anomaly and not require any external power to cool the fuel in the case of an accident or a shutdown or an earthquake or whatever. That's the kind of technology that they want. They don't want the old technology um, in which, you know, the old technology can be operated safely. The United States has had a hundred nuclear power plants and it had one serious accident in Pennsylvania, a three mile island, and it released radiation, uh, but it didn't kill anybody. You know, so the safety record of nuclear is actually the best of, of any energy. Um, I think that that needs to be one option as well as uh, renewable energies. And, um, that, that uh, I, I think, has the potential to provide carbon-free energy on the long run. Uh, but as long as there's no carbon fee, then fossil fuels are dirt cheap. You know, you can get coal out of the ground with a bulldozer. It, 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 it's very cheap if it doesn't have to pay for its cost to society. But the costs of the human health effects are, um, and the climate change effects are actually quite large. So we shouldn't allow the fuels, the fossil fuels to get away with dumping their waste without paying for it. Um, the next question is, are you in favor of research and or implementation of either main type of geoengineering, CDR, or SRM? You know, um, the earlier question about can you stop the climate change in 10 years? Well, we can't stop it in 10 years by slowing down our fossil fuel use. That's going to take longer. It would take 
a century. The biggest, you know, most of the climate impacts are reversible. Um, and so if we, we will want to restore a global temperature more like what it was in the 20th century. Uh, and that would stop the, you know, the excess fires <laughs> and uh, the other regional climate effects, the increased floods and things. Uh, but cooling the planet is uh, going is not going to happen on the, in less than a century just by reducing our uh, fossil fuel use. So in fact, there's going to be, now the, the one irreversible thing that we don't want to happen is um, melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet and sea level rise of several meters. If we lose our coastal cities, um, that's practically irreversible. So if that looks like it's a, it could happen, then the pressure for cooling the planet by means of probably aerosols, solar radiation management is going to grow. But we need to understand the system better before we get too serious about um, solar radiation management. I mean, we we know something about it. We there are natural experiments. The Pinatubo volcano in 1991 uh, put up enough aerosols in the stratosphere to reflect away sunlight four watts per meter squared. So the planet's energy balance, instead of being three quarters of a watt coming in, became three watts going out and the planet cooled off by three or four tenths of a degree Celsius within um, a year or so. So in fact, the, it works I and mean, it's very simple physics. We're just reflecting away uh, some sunlight. We may want to do that. Uh, I would, it actually probably makes more sense to have the to, uh, tropospheric aerosols where you're just spraying uh, droplets in, into the tropospheric atmosphere and reflecting sunlight. But we have to understand that. And it's, it would, you would want this to be a temporary um, expedient while you reduce emissions and gradually get carbon in the atmosphere back to a level more like what it was um, in the 1950s or so, 350 parts per million or maybe even less. Uh, but it's gonna take time to do that. And so it may well be that solar radiation management will um, be seriously considered in the not too distant future. Do you think the world will ever reach a sustainable civilization? If so, when? And um, the last part of the question says, what are the steps to reach it? Well, um, it would help if we didn't have so many people. And you know that um, we've reached the point in the Western world where the fertility rates are no higher than the replenishment level. And several nations are actually quite a bit less in Japan, China, and Europe, many European nations, the populations will actually decline in the future if uh, fertility rates stay where they are. So the nations that have become reasonably wealthy um, and women are educated uh, 
and and uh, the population um, may be uh, may not continue to rise. So I think it's important to first raise the standards of living uh, in the poorer countries, and it it just well, it does depend on education, uh, but but I I think uh, we're in a race to raise standard of living before we begin to have real climate problems. Uh, if we if we can win that race, then I think we can uh, stabilize, have a uh, sustainable. Uh, climate and planet, uh, but uh, that's, that's the interesting uh, uh, race that's going to be going on in the next several decades. Modern nuclear power and other clean power sources could help make a positive impact on our struggle to overcome our own mistakes, but is this enough without a fundamental change in human nature or in human behavior? What would it take to change our nature? Well, if we go to carbon-free energy, that will be sufficient to, that's, that's the main requirement to solve the climate problem. <clears throat> um, that, uh, It doesn't guarantee that we won't do something else that's that's foolish. Uh, but uh, it it's it, the energy problem is a solvable problem, and we could have uh, an environment and uh, a remarkable continue to have a remarkable uh, life on our planet. Um, but the first challenge is to get people the energy they need to have the lifestyles that they demand um, with, uh, without causing a climate problem. Do you see any workable carbon capture and sequestration methods on the horizon? Well, the carbon capture at power plants, you know, it just, it requires energy and it reduces the amount of energy that you're getting from the power plant. So I just don't see it uh, happening in the developing countries there where most of the increased emissions are coming from. Uh, it's certainly worth the research and development to try to uh, develop carbon capture, uh, but I don't think we can count on that. I, there are more or less natural ways to increase the sequestration of carbon in the soil and in the biosphere, uh, and even. In, in the ocean floor by increasing the rate of weathering uh, by uh, rock dust, by adding rock dust in farming, in agriculture, which increases the fertility of the soil. Uh, so yeah, there are many different ways besides just a simple chemical uh, carbon capture which will help in reducing um, the atmospheric carbon dioxide. For example, biochar. Uh, again, it's a way to improve the fertility of the soil uh, and uh, store more carbon in the soil at the same time.
Alrighty, with that, we are at the end of our time. Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for today. Everybody else who is in attendance, we appreciate your participation. To the students who helped put this together, you are rock stars. Keep doing great work.